Okay, so this is what we're after. So for anybody who missed it, this is kind of the drawing that we're going to be um, working toward finishing today. And uh, so just a preview, and I just wanted to let you know again to keep in mind where we're going to be drawing the various parts of it so that we don't run out of space. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off now and start with the parts of the animal, and we're going to put it together uh, from its bits. So here we go. Whoops, that's not the layer I needed. I'm just going to put a new layer here. Okay, so again, this is an 8.5 by 11 inch page, and we're going to start by drawing. Uh, so the first thing that I'd like you to do is go to about like the the right side of your screen, about maybe a quarter of the way in or so. We're going to make kind of like a, and you'll see the, the sort of the previews of these shapes just before I draw them, just to help you. Like a, a long lemon shape, it'll look like this. Kind of, or like a leaf. Kind of like a leaf, I guess. Okay. The idea here is that we have sort of uh, two sort of more sharp points on the sides and then uh, these two sort of smooth, rounded halves. I think kind of like a leaf or a, or a stretched lemon. And, you know, keep in mind it's on the right side of the page. So that is going to be uh, part of the sea otter's head. And so we're building this up from parts and from little simple shapes because that really helps us to not have to figure out uh, to try to see entire complex shapes in our mind at once. And in fact, artists do this all the time when we draw from, let's say, when we're looking at something that we're drawing, we try to break it down in our minds into simpler bits. And that helps us to be able to draw it without having our brain try to overlay too complex stuff and, and sort of preconceptions about it. So this is kind of how we work anyway. The next part we're going to add is going to make this little, little kind of a U-shape, an upside-down U-shape on the bottom half of that leaf, like this. Oh, sorry. There's my... I don't like that. Okay, so we're working on the sea otter's head, and that little U-shape is actually going to be the top of its nose. And you know what I'm going to do, actually, is now that we have established where this is, I'm going to zoom in a little bit so that we see it a little bit more clearly. And it's going to go over here. And now we can see it a little bit larger so that it's, uh, the details are a little clearer. Okay? So uh, the next thing we're going to do is the nose of a sea otter, uh, if you've ever seen one of them, they're, they're really adorable. Right? They've, they've got this really big nose pad. And, what it reminds me actually of is a koala. I have, have these really big noses that kind of stand up from their face. Sea otters are kind of like that in a sense. And they have this really adorable big teddy bear kind of nose. And so we're going to make the bottom half of its nose now. And the bottom half is kind of a little bit sharp pointed like that. You see the top half is rounded on top and then the bottom uh, half. You know how if you have a cat or a dog and... Uh, or if you've if you've seen one or if a friend has one, you can see where their nose ends and their mouth begins. There's often this kind of like a little pinched area and uh, the there's that sort of the whisker holder parts. And so the, the mouth begins into this little meets a nose in this kind of little um, uh, little crevice. And that's what we're kind of starting to see here. And so now we want to give our sea otter kind of cheeks. Now, two things we want to do here. Uh, and, and this is what I'm talking about, this, this, this mouth area where it begins. It kind of comes up and, and forms this kind of little V-shape. Make this lightly if you can. I, I can't really do it lightly myself, but I'll show you after what we're going to do. First of all, we're going to make these two curved lines like this to join the tip of that bottom of the nose with the sides of that leaf shape that we made first. This. Okay. Now, what we're going to want to do with this, though, is remember that sea otters are furry, right? So um, there are several different mammals that live in the water, mammals like you and us, uh, and we all have hair, and sea otters have hair. Uh, whales even have some hair. Some have whiskers on their faces, uh, and they have this kind of uh, hair that forms on their body um, before they're born that is lost, uh, called lanugo. And sea otters 
keep a lot of hair. They actually have the, the highest number of hairs uh, on any part of their body of any mammal on the planet. Um, something like, uh, I think it was 150,000 or so for every square centimeter, some huge, huge number. And so what we're going to do is to show that they're kind of hairy in on the cheeks here. We're going to make this cheek a little bit, um, a little jagged, like give it a little bit of um, fuzziness, you know, like, like this, instead of making it just smooth. Because this is one of the parts of the, of the face of the sea otter where you do see a lot of that fuzziness. Because the hairs kind of stand out a little bit on their cheeks and makes them look adorable like teddy bears. And they really are. So that's kind of where our, our sea otter's cheeks are. And, and then this point here at the, where the, the nose and the mouth meet, is there's this little kind of a V shape there. And that's where their mouth opens. And the other neat thing about sea otters and their noses it, and their ears, we'll get to the ears afterwards, is they can close those nostrils when they're diving. They're really interesting because they are adapted to living in the water so well that they can close off those holes so they don't get water in their nose when they're diving. Now we want to give the sea otter a mouth. Now, the drawing that I had to advertise this had a sea otter with his mouth closed. I thought it would be kind of fun to have one now that we've seen that with its mouth open. Because, you know, he's just kind of, they do all sorts of funny things. They open their mouth, they yawn, they, they munch on, uh, on urchins and such. And sometimes it's really cute when they open their mouth at us and just kind of look at us with their teeth. And this also gives us a chance to see their teeth. So we're going to make another little U shape. And this U shape starts from here at the just beside that V shape where the, the nose and the mouth meet. And then it goes like that. Okay. So this is going to be kind of the uh, open mouth of our sea otter. And now, if you happen to know what sea otters are related to, a lot of people might think that they're related closely to seals because they look like seals. In fact, they're not too closely related to seals. The reason they look like them is because they have evolved under similar kinds of, of pressures of their environments, uh, similar kinds of ways of life that, um, that are best served by a particular kind of a, a way that they, they look. Uh, they, they're, they're well adapted to diving and swimming in the water, and so they tend to look like seals. But in fact, sea otters are closely, they're, they're within the weasel family, right? It's called mustelidae. And they're actually the biggest weasels. Weasels and otters in general, otters and minks are all kind of types of weasels. These are the largest weasels, the heaviest weasels. They're not the longest, the giant otter, giant river otter is longer, but they're the heaviest. And they can grow up to about 30 to 50 kilograms at the biggest size. So they're really big. Okay. Now we also want to give our sea otter uh, a bit of lips on the lower, uh, on the lower jaw and the mouth they have these nice beautiful black lips and so we're just going to make a slightly wider um, uh, line a u-shape around the u-shape that we made for its mouth let's see what, what, I just went down there we go so we're just going to make it on the outside just outside of this initial u-shape we're just going to make a wee bit wider u-shape give it these nice black lips they're really adorable when they open their mouth at us okay so that's, now the mouth is developing. The next thing we want is we want to give it kind of a chin. So when sea otters open their mouth, you can tell that they've got a lot of like a sort of fat under their skin because they get this little double chin that happens when they open their mouth and their head is pointed downward sort of um, as they're floating on the water on their back. So we're going to make this wider U shape that's not fully connected to the cheeks, sort of under the mouth like that. And so... This sea otter's got its mouth open, and so it's kind of pushing together the fat under its chin and making this little bit of a double chin. And you've seen, if you've seen pictures of sea otters, or if you've been lucky enough to see a living sea otter, um, you'll have seen them floating on the water on their back, and that's how we're drawing ours. They are very buoyant, which means that they, they can float on water really well. And so they can float so well that, like, almost half of their body is out of the water. You can see their belly and their head uh, and usually their, their front legs and their, and their hind legs and sometimes their tail. And so they float like this normally. And um, what they do is when they dive, 
and they catch their prey, which is like urchins and, and, and uh, various kinds of shellfish, like clams and such, they'll rest that food on their tummy. And, um, and they can do this because they're floating on their back. And so this is what we're seeing. This animal is looking at us upward, and we're looking down into the water. Now we need eyes for our sea otter. Where we drew this um, leaf shape to begin with, we're going to put the eyes sort of halfway between the top of the nose, that U shape that we drew, and the corners of the leaf. So we're going to start with uh, its left eye, which is on our right side. Sea otters have pretty small eyes. Their vision is not particularly really good. They have a better sense of smell, it seems. But um, so we're going to draw a little sort of like a little ovals kind of thing, like one like that. You can actually fill it in because they look pretty black, like that. And then we're going to draw another one on the other side, again, about halfway between this U shape of the nose and the corner of that leaf shape, which that was the um, top of the head, like that. And in fact, also, we can draw maybe just a, I'm just going to make kind of a wee bit smaller here, just to make it easier to see. Um, we're going to make this little bit of a line here under the eyes, kind of like its its cheeks are. You know how it, it's when 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 you're really smiling and your cheeks get uh, all bunched up and they can push up and make it look like this little line under your eye, kind of like that, right? So it's, he's opening his mouth. Uh, he or she's opening his mouth, and then that's kind of like the the cheeks and the the sort of the whisker holders are pushing up. And uh, pushing up and, and, and kind of almost like half squinting the eyes. So there we go. Uh, the next thing that uh, we want to do here is we are doing here. Okay. So now uh, I'm just going to just turn this off. Just don't, don't worry. This is not going to go away. I'm just checking to see one thing here. Oh, yeah. Okay, good. Um, turn it back on. There we go. Okay, the next thing that we're going to do here, see, we can start to see the head building up, right? Now we want to give uh, a kind of like um, the top of the, the, the snout or the, the muzzle of the sea otter. There's a little bit of a line that happens between the eyes and above the nose. It's kind of like the bridge of the nose. So you're going to draw this sort of little light line above like this little curved line. So because we're looking at the sea otter's face head on or face on, and so we're actually seeing the snout going away from us a little bit, right? Uh, or into the page, if you like. And so this is kind of like the top, uh, the back of the top edge of the, the snout or muzzle um, and, and just sort of where like the, the bridge of your nose, basically. So that's kind of what's happening there. Okay, now uh, sea otters have ears. They have visible ears. They're like the fur seals that way. So if you've ever seen, for example, well, if you've ever seen the, the, the harbor seals around uh, the West Coast, you see that they don't have visible outer ears. They just have sort of like little holes. They've lost their ears over evolutionary time from when they were land dwelling. But fur seals um, do have little ears. And there's actually um, a, um, a fur seal, I think, that is now uh, one of the patients at the MMR as well. Um, and... Uh, sea otters like fur seals also have visible ears so we're going to make little ears for our sea otter here and you're going to start at the corner of that first leaf shape that we drew for the head we're going to go like this this little my computer doing funny. there we go little notch like that you see it's almost like a it's a tiny little book shape on each side of the head like that because again we're looking at the face and these are very small ears they don't need ears for much of like for very much for hearing um, for what they hunt, right? Because the, their prey, their food doesn't run around very much. It doesn't they don't have to pursue it like let's say a land predator. They pick it off the bottom of the ocean, uh, sea urchins and clams and such, uh, and they can, as I mentioned, close these ears when they dive so they don't get water in their ears, right? It's kind of a weird feeling when you get water in your ears. Well, sea otters don't have to worry about that which is really neat, I think. Um, so that's, that's the ears. Now, the next thing we're going to do here, okay, so here's where I mentioned it's good if, if you have an eraser or if you did these lines lightly, we're going to erase out a couple of lines just to make it uh, uh, look a little more like a sea otter. And the lines that we're going to erase out 
um, are that I'm just going to change the color of this so that I can make it easier. You remember when we drew that leaf shape at first? Okay, so we drew that leaf shape because it was very helpful for us to be able to, to use those shapes to guide us in drawing other parts. But now what we're going to do is we're going to erase out one half of that leaf shape. Okay, so if you go to the bottom edge of that, I'm just going to show you what we're going to do. We're just like this. If you can sort of erase out that line a bit, but if it's not fully erased, that's okay. If you can't erase it, don't worry about it because that's still going to look fine. It's just one extra little line like that. Also, we can erase out some of that same leaf part from the nose, from the middle of the nose like that. Okay. So now what you see has happened is that that what was actually sort of a guideline is now uh, gone. And this is how we sometimes do when we're drawing. We can maybe draw the lines that we can erase out later but that help us in the beginning. So that's what we've just done there. Now we're going to go back to continuing adding the parts of the sea otter. So far, we're still on the face. Now, what we want to do is add the details of the nose. Okay, so we've added the outline of the nose nicely, but now we want to add just a few little details in the nose. One of them is that on the front of the nose, there's kind of like an edge. Like if you have a doggy or a cat, you can see that the front tip of the nose, there's a little edge on it. For a sea otter... Um, that looks like this. Uh, you know, if you're going to draw like a gull uh, in the sky, you know how you sometimes have those little like, two, like a little rounded M shape, kind of like that. It's a little down in the middle because they have a little bit of a notched nose. Also, we can actually add the nostrils. Uh, and so what we're going to do is under that gull shape, we're going to make two little little sort of half, half circles that come from the side of the nose. Whoopsie. All right. Oh, that's my computer doing funny things. That's okay. We'll work with it like this. Okay. So there are the nostrils. And remember, I mentioned that those nostrils can be closed when they dive so that they don't get water in their nose. And uh, so it's really neat how they are. Now we're going to add teeth to our sea otter. And this is why I thought it would be fun to draw a picture of a sea otter with its mouth open, because this way we get to kind of show uh, what groups of animals it's related to. And sea otters, as I mentioned, are um, with what are called mustelids or, or uh, weasels. And weasels are a member of uh, a group of mammals called carnivores. And carnivores describes not just that they typically eat meat or animal, other animals, but the fact that they are a group that has a particular kind of, of teeth. These teeth are well made for, for eating meat. So, for example, these have these large teeth called canines. And canines are those, those sort of slightly longer teeth in your mouth. Uh, you have four of them, two in the top and two in the bottom. And we're going to draw the canines of our little sea otter. This, you know, I'm going to just thicken my brush a little bit here because that's a little harder to see. Fix that up here. Okay, so I'm going to redraw that canine. This, whoops, <laughs> that's a little bit large. So this is the thing, right? Uh, we sometimes just have to fix bits of what we draw, and that's okay. I'm just going to redraw it here like that. Just a little bit of a, uh, a slightly curved line, but you can see it's basically like a tooth on the side, inside the mouth, right, like that. So these two larger teeth, they're those big, sharp teeth, like if, you, if your doggy can open their mouth and you can see that they, they're those larger, long teeth, those are the ones we're talking about. Also, in between those two canines, on the bottom jaw and this open mouth, sea otters have four little incisor teeth. Like the, your, the front teeth in your mouth, if you open those very front teeth, those are incisors. But in sea otters, they're also a little bit sharply pointed, not like ours, not so flat. There's four of them. One, two, three, four. You, know, you could fit four in there somehow in between. Little ones. Okay, so that's, now it's, it's starting to have a kind of a sea otter grin with those teeth. You can also add, there's a couple of um, uh, teeth in the back of the mouth that you can just see now when its mouth is open. And just above the canines, there's going to be, you can add a very little line up here. Oops. There, like that, and one on this side here. There, and those are kind of like the back, like molars, and, and actually in, in, 
Now, see, that would be molars in, in regular other mammals that eat, eat plants, but in, in these carnivores, we have what are called carnassials. These are kind of used to slice meat. Not as, as big a deal here, and they are shaped differently in sea otters because they can then get into these hard um, types of food they eat, like the shells of sea urchins, and, uh, and to open up. Um, actually, the way that they open up is really cool. <laughs> sea urchins and clams that they eat have hard shells, right? But these little mammals, they eat meat. So what do they do? They actually bring up these these uh, sea urchins and, 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 and clams in these little sort of like pouches under their arms. And they also carry rocks in these pouches. And they're really interesting because these are some of the only mammals that use tools. They use those rocks that they bring up and they smash the shell of their, uh, of their food, of the, the, the shellfish, and then they can get to the soft parts inside. So they're really smart little animals. They get to open up the shells using rocks. So, and then that way they have these teeth that can yeah, chew on the, the, the nice soft insides. So now we're going to add a bit of a tongue to the sea otter here. Uh, basically, it's not going to be much to add here. Just kind of, you need to add a little bit of a line down the center of the inside of the mouth. Because you know how like your tongue can have a little bit of a groove in the middle? That's kind of what we're seeing here. And then if you want to, you can add um, the, the bottom, the, the tip of the tongue, kind of a little curved shape just above the teeth. There. It's smiling at us. Um, they have the most adorable smile, I think. They just, I mean, it's not, a, it's not a human smile. It's not intended to be a smile, but they sure look like it. And so we have to remember when we are caring for these animals, and I had the distinct pleasure to work, uh, to volunteer at the Marine Mammal Rescue Center to help um, rehabilitate baby seals that were orphaned to be re released into the wild. We wanted to make sure that we didn't interact with them and didn't stare at them much because we don't want them to get used to humans. Um, because they need to live on their own in the wild. And so we tend to like to think of them as smiling, um, you know, because we like to kind of have these human traits that we add onto animals. But we have to remember that these are these have their own expressions and we just interpret them a certain way. Anyway, we're also going to add a little bit of a, uh, an extra little uh, other little chin-like line here between that larger chin line at the bottom and the mouth. Is this sometimes the little folds of, of, of flesh that happen when they open their mouth and they really kind of squish their chin together like that. Okay? Now, the other thing is that sea otters have these great big whiskers. And this is useful, right? Because these animals, they, they look around the bottom of the ocean looking for, for their prey, which, right, is the clams and sea urchins and stuff. And they don't have good vision so much, but they feel around. And these whiskers, like on cats and dogs, are very useful for feeling around their face. And so these whiskers can help them to find their prey. And what we're going to do is going to put a bunch of big whiskers. They have really cute whiskers where there are some smaller whiskers near the nose and they get longer kind of toward the side of their cheeks. And so watch how I'm going to do this. I'm going to make these small curved whiskers near the nose coming down and they get longer as I go out toward the side of the cheeks like this. And what you see there is it makes an interesting kind of a, a almost like a flat surface in the front where the, the length of these whiskers makes them very useful for feeling around them. And so they can use them to help them to find their prey. And they're very stiff whiskers. They're thick, thick hairs. Um, and again, this makes them just look all the cuter as well. Okay, so now our sea otter has whiskers, which it can use for um, helping it find its uh, seafood. And um, this is actually an important thing to remember, too, that they eat this seafood, these clams. And we also do, right? A lot of people like uh, clams and such. We have to be careful as much as we can to select foods that have been taken from the ocean um, responsibly in ways that, that don't harm sea otters because we share the same food. So we want to make sure we get along with them. And so there are organizations like, for example, Ocean Wise and um, Seafood Watch that help to oversee fishing operations um, to make sure that they're doing it in a way that doesn't harm um, animals like sea otters that are sharing food that we also eat. So now we're going to, we've got pretty much our, our sea otter's face ready. We're going to start to add other parts like his neck. So her neck starts like this. So we're going to go to the bottom of, of the ear on the right side. And we're going to draw this curved line that comes down from there like this. It's a nice big chunky kind of a neck. Again, they have a lot of uh, nice 
fat underneath, underneath their fur as well because this also helps them to keep their heat in because the water is really cold that they live in, right? They live in northern waters all the way, well, not all fully northern. Some of them are all from southern California and from Mexico all the way along the west coast of North America right up to Alaska and then around the Pacific Ocean on the top through toward Russia. And so these are mostly northern waters and they tend to be pretty cold, so they need a lot of protection. That's um, given them both by the, the fat under their skin and also by the large amount of fur they have. For the other half of the neck, we're going to start from the other ear and make a little curved line and a different sort of curvature than the one we did. It'll come down like this because this sea otter is turning her head sort of as she's looking up at us. Okay, So this is why the neck looks curved. Now we're going to... We're heading down toward the the front legs, okay? So now what we want to do is actually I made this this curve a little bit oops, a little bit too long on this side here, but I'm just going to fix that. Sorry, um, let me just fix that here. I went a little too far on the curve on the neck on on the first side. It's okay. We can always fix these things. As artists, we have to be ready to sketch to fix our work as we go and it's all right if we make mistakes we'll just fix them up so now um as i mentioned we're going to make the the area where 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 the sea otter's arms are okay so the body kind of widens out there so if we continue from the bottom of the neck on this side this little curve here that bulges out and there's going to be a bulge on the other side as well on the neck that's further from us that so this is where the arms meet the body. And so the sea otter is floating on the water. And we're seeing that the sides of uh, his or her body kind of bulge out here. Okay, I'm going to zoom out a bit now. Because we want to now see more of the body. Because we're starting to add... Whoops, I went and zoomed off. We're going to start to see more of the body. Um, and so now we're going to add kind of like a... Like a, I don't know, banana shape or, or like most of an eggplant, you know, or, or a, a watermelon or long watermelon shape kind of thing. From and, and actually, here I'm going to I'm going to increase the size of my pen because it's a little harder to see this. Oh, oops, that's fine. There's no numeric entry. I love it when the computer talks to me. Um, here we go. This should help. Now I'm going to continue. Uh, from where we were, and from the bottom of those, those bulges for the arms, we're going to make this body shape. It comes out like a long, uh, like a banana. Well, not quite a banana, I guess, like, a, like I said, an eggplant or a long sort of like a sausage shape like that. So what we're seeing here is that the rest of the body of the sea otter, uh, we're looking down on its stomach, on its belly. And so this is part of it that's floating and sticking out of the water, kind of like that. And so sea otters mostly stick out, or a large part of them sticks out of the water, but some of them is still underwater. So you can just imagine that we're seeing that the belly and that the back of the sea otter is in the water. We're looking down on the sea otter. Okay. Next, we're going to give it pause. So one of the wonderful things about sea otters is that they're so well adapted to life in the water. They have these short little legs. And if you've ever seen like a corgi, a dog uh, breed that, that have those really, really short little legs, think of a sea otter as like a, a weasel, uh, like a corgi weasel, in that they have even shorter arms than, than weasels. Weasels already have short arms, but sea otters have really short little stubby arms. They're really, really cute. And so we're going to make these two like almost like mitten shapes. One comes down from this where, where the body bulged out, this, and the U shapes. And the other one, it'll be on the other side, doing the same thing, but in the opposite direction, like that. So sea otters lay on their back in the water, and they, their, paws typically, um, their paws typically just kind of hang out on the front of them like this. And the neat thing about these paws is they're, they're very manipulative. They can use them to, to grab their food and move their food around so they can bring it to their mouth. And then, and then remember I mentioned they can use those, those rocks they carry to smash at the food so they can actually hold uh, rocks pretty well. And they've, the bottom of their hand, if you look at it, it has these little folds that, that help it to hold things. Okay. And um, when they're sleeping, <laughs> 
it's a really adorable thing. You might have seen photos of sea otters that when they sleep, they float on their backs just like this. And then sometimes they form what are called rafts. They'll hang out in groups, um, let's say all, all males or all females. Uh, and then when they're sleeping, sometimes to avoid you know, floating apart, they'll hold hands while they're sleeping with the otter next to them. And they hook their little paws into each other. The most adorable things that way. Also, to keep them from floating away when they're sleeping, they'll sometimes wrap themselves in long lines of kelp, which are like a type of uh, kind of a seaweed kind of. A, it's not a plant, but it looks like a plant and it functions like a plant. Um, so these are, these are ways that they, uh, that they keep from floating away while they're asleep. Okay, so now we need to give uh, little fingers to the sea otter. So these are little stubby hands. They don't have long fingers, but we're going to see these little sort of lines that, that show where the fingers separate from each other. And so if we look at the, the paw, I'm going to zoom in a bit. Look at the paw closest to us. We're going to draw four little lines that show where the thumb is and then the rest of the four fingers. The one in the middle here is actually quite short. They're, those fingers are pretty close together like that. And then on the other side, on the other paw, we have the lines that come like this. We're basically, it's kind of like, think of like a, a glove with thick fingers. And they, they don't separate so well. They don't need long fingers to manipulate the food. They just need these. And so this is all they've got. Okay, so those are the hands of our sea otter ready to hold food. Now I'm going to zoom out and we're going to start to put the back legs on our sea otter. So two little curved lines toward the back of the, of the body, toward the bottom of the tummy. We're going to un underside on the bottom side here. We're going to draw a long curved line like that, sort of longish. I guess. Then on the top of the belly, we're going to draw another little curved line, Oops, another curved line like this. And those are basically the, the tops of these curves are kind of where the knees of the sea otter are. Okay, so they have these two legs are kind of just hanging out the back of their body, not doing much right now because they're just floating at the surface. But as we're gonna draw those uh, hind feet, we're gonna see that they're very, very useful for diving because that is one of the main things that sea otters use uh, to propel themselves, to, to push themselves forward through the water. They're very powerful hind legs. So what we're going to do now is start to work on the feet. So this is going to be kind of the ankles first. Uh, on the leg that's furthest from us, on the upper side of the sea otter, we're going to draw this kind of like, like a diamond shape, kind of like a kite. We're going to start at the bottom of the tummy like this and draw kind of a four-sided kind of diamond shape like this. Okay. Think of, if you look at your foot, um, your your heel, yeah, the back of your heel there, uh, uh, don't draw this line, but that's this part. Okay? Down here is the heel. Uh, this part here, all of this, this is kind of like the, the bottom of our foot uh, for the sea otter. And so they have these beautiful paddles of their hind feet. And the bottom of the foot that we just, that I just showed you is part of that paddle. Uh, we're going to draw that also on the other foot, and we're going to make sort of another kind of a kite shape. Um, start the bottom here. These four lines that make kind of a diamond shape or kite shape. That is the foot on our side of the sea otter that is, again, kind of like the bottom of the foot. Now, the sea otter, as I mentioned, uses these hind feet as paddles powerfully to push it through the water. And part of the paddle is made up by the toes. And sea otter's toes are proportional to their foot much longer than our toes. Um, so if you look at your toes, they're pretty short. And imagine if your toes were about as long as the rest of your foot. That's kind of like what we're seeing with a sea otter. And then imagine if your toes were webbed, so there was a lot of like uh, skin between all your toes. That's how a sea otter's foot is shaped. And that if you imagine, looks a lot like if you go diving, you wear those flippers. Well, that's exactly what's happening. Their feet are shaped like flippers, and they can use those to, uh, like flippers to push them through the water. So we're going to draw the sort of the group of toes on the far side of, of the, the leg there. And it's going to be kind of like a little balloon shape coming off the end. Because what's going to happen here is 
Um, this sea otter is floating at the surface now, and it's just kind of resting its feet, and those toes are just kind of hanging off. Um, that's one of them. And then the other one on our side, um, on, on, our, on the, the foot on our side here, and it comes off like this, and it's like this. Now, keep in mind, one thing is going to gonna have to watch for. You see that the shape I made is a U shape, but notice that, now, don't draw this part, but I'm going to draw a couple of arrows. Notice that on this side, the, this is where the toes are longest, and on the inside, they're a little bit shorter toes. And I'm going to show you in a second when we draw the toes. The reason for that is because they can then use these um, flippers, as they are effectively, to swim effectively when they're on their back as well. Those longer toes are more effective at pushing water, pushing themselves through water. So when they're on their back, having those longer toes on the outside helps them to push around. They can still move around. I'm going to add those toes now. Um, to the, 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 the set of toes. We're going to show them separated, just like we did with the fingers on the hand. And we're going to make these little lines. Oops, lines. <laughs> My computer's being funny. That's okay. We make lines, four of them, because there are five toes. So four lines separating the toes. Two, three, and four. And notice that here we have the longest toes on the outside. Okay. And... We're going to make little tiny claws at the ends. And I'm going to try, I'm going to zoom in a little bit because it'll be easier to see what's happening. So in the middle of each of these toes, we're going to give them little tiny claws. Not large. They're little ones like this, but they hang off a little bit just like that. Okay. We're going to do a similar thing on the foot on the other side of the animal. So we're just going to make these toes again. And here we're seeing it a little bit from the side. That's why that those set of toes are kind of flatter looking and the, 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 the U-shape we made on our side. Because we're seeing the feet from two different angles. And here the toes, the line separating the toes are curved because again, if you look at your hand from the side rather than from the palm, you can see that your hand changes in shape. And this is what we're doing as artists. We try to imagine what um, objects look like from different angles. And this is what I'm showing you here is how to draw a otter foot, a sea otter foot from two different angles. We're going to make little claws on this foot as well. And for that, we're going to just going to make these little, little tiny lines here because again, and notice that you can only see four toes here. I don't draw this part, but these are angle, uh, little arrows I'm putting in. You see this four because one of the toes is sort of just not really visible. It's behind the others because of how how it's held. Oops, sorry. I'm just going to erase this out. So those are the hind feet of the sea otter, and you can see when I zoom out. Uh, see, here we go. You can see how much larger those feet are than the than the front paws of, of the sea otter, because those are the ones. Those hind feet are the ones that it uses to propel itself through the water. Very powerful. Now we're going to give it a little tail. Now the tail isn't always visible above the water. They can hang sort of underwater, but we're going to make a tail that's that's sort of curled and 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 it's she's just curling it up so you can just see it. And so we're going to start at the bottom of the foot closest to us and just make kind of like a long hook shape, not too long. They're relatively short tails compared to some other animals, but they're still about that long. So we're you know it's not like a like a kangaroo tail, not really long, but you know, it's, it's sort of long. So they also use their body kind of, and, and they undulate their body to swim as well, partly in addition to their, they're using their, their paddles of their hind feet. So they kind of have like a dual kind of um, propulsion system. That tail is also partly useful for helping push them through the water. And so it's slightly flattened. Um, and you'll see that with other otters as well. And if you've been on the west coast here in Vancouver Island, or on Vancouver Island, or on the west coast of BC, or anywhere uh, where sea otters live, you can also sometimes see um, these river otters that share a similar habitat, but closer to the coast. And they look a little like sea otters, but they're smaller, a um, little bit more uh, you know, graceful, less chunky, um, and they're also closely related to them. So you can actually see how similar they are in some ways. And they have a little bit more longer tails, I think. So now what we're going to do is we're going to give the sea otter something to munch on. So this sea otter has just come back from diving underwater and has found a sea urchin. 
And the reason I'm selecting a sea urchin is because it's going to allow us to say something fun about um, how important sea otters are to marine ecosystems. And remember, an ecosystem is a group of different animals and plants and other life forms that live together in a community and in their environment. Uh, and all of them interact with each other and uh, they accomplish an, an interesting network of, of life that, that sort of functions in a certain way. And these ecosystems like forests, um, or prairies, or in the case of sea otters, um, kelp forests, uh, work only under certain circumstances. And here's what we're going to talk about. So first of all, we're going to make this circle sort of just below and between the paws. Sea otter has taken a sea urchin from the bottom of the ocean, it's come to the surface, carried it with its little paws, and is now resting it on its tummy. Uh, the sea urchin really can't move around very much out of water. They use their spines to move around, but it's really slow moving. So there's no chance that this is really going to get away. It's, a, it's, it's its food. And the sea urchin, this is before the sea urchin has gotten to the inside, but is resting after it's dived. That, is the, that round circle we just made is the main body of the sea urchin. And just to remind us, a sea urchin is related to sea stars or starfish, as they're called sometimes. But it's a different group of them. So we've all, or most of us have seen um, sea stars or starfish. They have these five or six or more, a greater number of arms. But sea urchins um, don't have arms. Uh, instead, what they have are spines, and they have spines of different lengths. Now, the one that we're going to look at here has... Recognize oh. his voice. Sorry? Oh, I think... I think we had uh, there somebody... Was, there, there was Brenda, one of our moderators, just saying hi, oh, I guess. Oh, oh hi. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> All right. Um, there we go. So, yeah. So, now we're going we're gonna to put some spines on the sea urchin because this is one of them that has long spines. They also eat sea urchins with shorter spines. But they're really neat because they can actually still get inside the sea urchins even if they're spiny. And there aren't a lot of animals that can. Sea urchins have these spines partly because they can use them to move around. They use them like legs, but they're also very useful against predators who would want to eat them because they're soft on the inside and they would make a really good meal. For sea otters, they do make a really good meal. So what you see here is I'm drawing all these spines, long spines on the outside of this circle or the sea urchin. Um, sea otters have, gotten, have found a way to get around these spines. And that's very, very important for uh, the kelp forest ecosystems in which they live. So these spines here don't get in the way of the sea otter because, as I mentioned before, sea otters use rocks that they carry to basically smash their way past the spines and open up the sea urchin to get at the soft, gushy stuff inside. Uh, sea urchins are an important part of of the sort of biological communities of animals and plants and stuff that live in the ocean. But in some places, they can be very, very effective at reproducing, at, at making more of themselves, and they eat kelp. What is kelp? Kelp is a type of, I guess you could call it seaweed, is a sort of a, a, a common term for it. It's a type of, of, of organism, a life form that lives in the ocean that um, use sunlight like plants do. They're not plants, but they live like plants that they photosynthesize. And so this is, I'll draw a picture. You don't have to do this, but I'll draw a picture on the side of what one type of kelp looks like. This is bull kelp. And, and these ones are found on our coasts here. So they have this, this, this sort of gas-filled um, bulge or bulb, basically, and a long thing called a stipe. Now, this is not to scale with the otter. In, in other words, this is a very, very, very tiny version of bull kelp. Okay, so they can get bigger than this. In other words, this long stipe that I drew here, it's a stem sort of. It can grow much, 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 much longer. And it can grow thicker than that. And this bulb here is filled um, kind of with uh, gas and it floats at the surface. At the end of this bulb, it has these long, um, what are called blades. They're, they're soft and flexible and they function like leaves. They're not leaves, it's not a plant, but they function like leaves in that they gather sunlight and have uh, cells inside them that then convert the sunlight energy and make food for themselves, just like plants do. 
And this bulb here allows them to float at the surface and keep the, the blades at the surface where they capture sunlight. So in reality, um, this long stem or stipe, uh, compared to the sea otter, um, can grow maybe about that thick or so. So think of it like that. And that can grow to be many, many meters long. So these anchor themselves at the bottom of the ocean with these things called holdfasts. And they look a little like roots. And they function a little bit like roots of plants in that they hold themselves uh, onto rocks with them. They grab rocks like a, like a hand. But they don't um, use them to gather nutrients like plants do. They just hold themselves to the bottom. Now, the reason why I'm explaining all of this is that sea urchins come along. And uh, so these, these kelp they form forests on the bottom of the ocean in some of these places. There are many, many of them, like trees. And if you swim among them, it looks like a forest from underneath. And they can be many, many meters tall. So it's an amazing place. But these sea urchins come along, and here's the rock on the bottom of the, of the ocean. The sea urchin comes along with its spines. Um, and they munch on things. They munch on algae. Uh, algae are like some types of seaweeds and so on. And they love kelp, for example. And they'll munch on kelp, uh, especially when they're young, but at any size anyway. And they'll basically mow down these forests of kelp when they grow uh, and, and don't have anything to eat them. Ecosystems are neat because they have balances. Different animals and plants, uh, well, animals, they eat each other and other plants. And they grow in number according to how much food they have. So see... Uh, sea urchins, when nothing eats them, they just multiply and multiply, and they can eat all of the kelp in an area and completely mow down these kelp forests. And that completely changes the ecosystem because kelp forests are very important as nursery areas for fish that then we also rely on for food. So the fish grow up in kelp forests and that protect them from predators because like forests, their predators can't see them as well in there, for example. And they have lots of nutrients that they eat there as well. So when sea urchins have nothing eating them, they mow down kelp forests and change the ecosystem completely. Now, sea otters come along, and they love to eat sea urchins, among other things. And so when you have a healthy population of sea otters in an area, these sea urchins can't multiply so much that they destroy the kelp forests. There's this beautiful balance that happens in a healthy ecosystem um, that includes sea otters that allows kelp forests to flourish. And this is why it's so important that sea otters were protected back in 1911, because at one time they were hunted for their fur, which, as I mentioned, was really dense and is very sought after by the fur industry. Um, when they were protected, their numbers bounced back. They went down to about one or 2,000 animals on the entire planet, which is very, very, very small. Uh, most cities have people, you know, around close to a million people, many of them. And so that's like a thousand times as many as there were sea otters at one time. Now, their numbers are a lot healthier. They're closer to maybe 150-ish thousand of them. So they've grown in size a lot. And that has helped our um, kelp forests on our coast to recover as well because the sea otters eat the sea urchins that would otherwise mow down the kelp forest. So this is why it's important for us to engage in conservation, to, to watch out, to make sure that sea otters are safe and other life forms are safe. Because like sea otters, there are many types of animals and plants and other types of life forms in these ecosystems that help to establish these balances uh, to keep each other's numbers in check so that the, you have this incredible diversity of life that exists. And sea otters, because they do this, they help to maintain kelp forests. They are called what are known as keystone species. You might hear that term sometimes. That means that they they are very, very important, just like the the stone that was on top of arches helped support arches. That was called the keystone. Uh, they they help support the ecosystem in, in the structure that 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 it is in when it's healthy. So anyway, there we go. That's our sea otter uh, with its, uh, with its uh, sea urchin uh, meal ready to eat. It's all happy, ready to have a nice lunch and help keep kelp forests uh, healthy. And, uh, and that's basically been our, our, our talk and, and our, our, our drawing session with sea otters. And I hope that you've had lots of fun with this. Uh, and with that, I'll, I'll, I'll hand it back to Marcus and the rest of the administration team here. And I guess we'll have Maybe you have questions. 
Yes. Well, thank you, first of all, so much for this. This was so entertaining. Um, <laughs> I was uh, watching our chat on YouTube and uh, one of our moderators uh, noticed that uh, our Discord chat had become totally quiet because people had started uh, to, oh, wow. to draw <laughs> with you and they were paying attention to what you were saying. And I learned a lot, uh, things that I didn't know about kelp, for instance. Of course, I know mm -hmm. about the relationship between uh, sea urchins and kelp, but how that all actually works, um, I, I'd never been, um, I'd never had somebody explain that to me. So that was awesome. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'm actually going to try and do something crazy, um, something we normally don't do, uh, do but we're going to see how this works. Um, I'm going to go and uh if i can manage to return to discord people can't actually see this on the stream that's good uh, i'm gonna open up this channel for our regulars and allow them to talk in this channel Ooh, okay. yeah. um something we don't normally do so everybody who is uh, currently in our events video channel if you do have a question um please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, do ask and in the meantime uh, while people are still considering what they might want to ask um i'm going to pass on a question uh, that we had on our youtube chat earlier uh, somebody just wanted to know what kind of uh, educational path did you go to become an, an, an illustrator how how did you end up being an illustrator and did you have any any special kind of education to learn how to how to illustrate oh that's a good question uh <laughs> it's it, it, it's going to be not very helpful in this case for uh, for for answering this question because i didn't really make um, much um, uh, to be an illustrator um i my background is in science actually so i uh learned to be an ecologist. Uh, this is somebody who studies ecosystems and how animals and plants and other life forms interact with each other in their environment. So that's what I did um, for my undergraduate degree in, in uh, university and for my master's degree. And then for my PhD, I studied um, uh, bacteria and sort of microbiology and the bacteria in extreme environments and also did a lot of the sort of ecosystem studies of them. Um, so I became an illustrator after, or while during the, my PhD degree, um, I, I started to get contacted by publishers and museums to see if I was interested in, in creating work for them because I had posted some of my artwork, which I had done as a hobby online on my website before that, and they had seen it. And then some of it appeared in magazines as well. I don't have very much art instruction. I did take one art course in university, but mostly I'm self-taught. So it's something that I've just done for years and years, uh, ever since I was maybe three years old. Um, and I've just been practicing as a hobby ever since then. And then in 2005, I started to do this um, professionally, commercially. Uh, that's when I started to become contacted by um, publishers and museums. And since then, I've just been doing it a lot. <laughs> and, and so it's just something that I've built up over time um, with lots of practice and watching how other artists work and um, learning from books that artists write. And um, it's just been a very fun experience that way. Well, and it's, it's certainly led to, to some fascinating work. You've, you've illustrated things like... Otters and they're talking about otters. I, I can hear myself in the background. That's funny. It may just be people talking. Um, it's, it's that two things, like you've illustrated books, um, you've illustrated uh, stamps. Uh, I, I always, whenever I go to the post office, I see your stamp collection with those sharks. Uh, right. th those are amazing illustrations. I think you've done a coin too, right? Uh, well, actually, my wife, Alexandra LaFord, and I, we've both uh, done uh, coins for the Royal Canadian Mint. I think between the two of us, we must have designed over 40 coins, I think, something like that. Wow. <laughs> um, and of course, uh, those coins are actually worth uh, real money. Um, yeah. those, those are <laughs> silver coins, right? Well, they vary. So most of them are silver, but there have been a few gold ones as well. Uh, the, the, the biggest one I've ever done was a one kilogram silver coin and a one kilogram <laughs> gold coin oh my uh, gosh those are collectors and they are worth uh the gold one was worth sixty nine thousand dollars each wow they only made 10 of them <laughs> so <laughs> that's a bit heavy to carry around in your wallet too <laughs> not not pocket change that's for sure <laughs> <laughs> it comes with a handy car to carry it around 
Actually, when they deliver it, I think it comes with a um, a security van that's like a, one of those armored vehicles that comes to deliver it if you order one of those. <laughs> <laughs> I can only imagine that. Oh, wow. Um, and of course, you, you, you've illustrated many books. Uh, last time I saw you, you signed uh, a few of those books for me. Um, oh. One was about sharks. Um, and the whales tired. one with the recent yes, one as well. Yes, one was discovering cetaceous. whales, dolphins, and the porpoises. That's right. Which includes the vaquita in it as well. That's right. Um, we're definitely going to share the link to your website uh, in our chat rooms. I believe you do have links pointing to maybe Amazon and places where people can have a look at those those books because they are they are simply amazing. So um, uh, if if you've never seen any of Julius's work, uh, check out his website to see some of his uh, paleo art. Uh, painting animals that have long gone extinct, but he, he's also a very accomplished uh, illustrator when it comes to animals that are still with us, thankfully. Uh, and um, mm. it, it's, it's really worth just having a look at that and maybe owning uh, one or two of those books as well. I'm privileged to have, <laughs> to have some of those. Thanks to you, Julius, for <laughs> bringing them along. Um, and uh, it's, it's definitely something you guys should check out. So um, once again, turning it over to our Discord chat, is there anybody who wants to unmute uh, themselves and actually has a question for Julius or anybody else in our uh, YouTube chat room as well? Um, someone asked, I can hear myself. <laughs> um, so, someone on YouTube asked uh, if you have won any uh, awards as an illustrator and if you have, which ones? Oh, yes. Um, yes, so I did. Uh, um, there is an award that is given out by um, the Society of uh, Vertebrate Paleontology. So these are people that study um, prehistoric animals uh, that are like you and I that have a uh, spinal column, the, the vertebrae. And so like dinosaurs and amphibians and various other kinds of you know, birds or dinosaurs uh, or, or mammals, um, including there are some you know prehistoric types of sea otter relatives. Anyway, um, so... This organization um, that I, I, I'm a part of and I go to uh, the meetings, the annual meetings or online meetings these days um, that they meet and they, you, you can actually enter a contest um, for what is called the Lanzendorf um, Paleo Art Prize. And that's organized by um, a person called John Lanzendorf, who has a wonderful collection of, of paleo art or artwork that features prehistoric animals and plants and such. And uh, uh, so this prize is given out um, to the winner of this competition. Um, I've won three of those ones. Uh, and then there were a couple of other ones. One of, uh, one of the pieces that I did uh, for a museum in um, uh, a museum of the Red River. Uh, it's an acanthosaurus that won Best in Show. Um, and so those are some of the, the, the kind of awards I've won that have, I've been very privileged and honored to be able to be recognized with those. Um, it's always nice to have, you know, your peers, uh, recognize your work as being, uh, worth something that I really enjoy to be able to be, uh, doing something that is also helping to promote science and conservation and education. And, um, you know, having these awards is nice, but it's really nice to, to see that the work is appreciated in many other ways as well, just from the compliments I get people or the fact that people enjoy the books and so on. That's very rewarding to me. It's especially rewarding when I can do books, especially for kids, because um, kids are, 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 are so inspirable and they are going to be our future leaders and our future scientists and responsible citizens. And so I find it very important to uh, to put effort into making uh, colorful and fun books for kids because, you know, anything that we can do to inspire people to be interested in caring for the natural world is helpful. And to me, that's important. Does that answer your question, Tiny? Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I think it does. Okay, well, <laughs> uh, well, Julius, this, this was an awful lot of fun. Uh, I hope we can do this again. I've already had people asking, can we can we draw a baby otter next time? Or maybe, Ooh, right. maybe, maybe we <laughs> baby can. Baby otters are adorable, oh my goodness, right? <laughs> 
We just might. Uh, and of course, originally, I think when you first offered to do this uh, more than a year ago, you, you offered uh, to uh, make this about harbor seals since that's the number one patient. Yeah, Baby right. harbor seals are mm -hmm. the number one patients at the rescue center. So we wanted to do a harbor seal. So who knows? We might just do this again. That would be nice. Yep, I'd, I'd certainly enjoy it. <laughs> well, I did too. Thank you so much, Julius. We had uh, at times over 300 people watching this oh, uh, nice. between Get our on. YouTube channel right and Discord. Excellent. So this uh, has definitely been worth it. Thank you so much, Julius, uh, for this today. <laughs> Really love this. And uh, if anybody still has questions for Julius, um, uh, I'm certainly going to still hang out in our events chat channel on uh, Discord. And uh, please feel free to uh, stay with us for a few more minutes. I think, Julius, we had planned to do this until 1230. So we have about 15 okay. minutes. If anybody still has any questions, uh, we can do this off stream. And uh, I'm going to already say goodbye to everyone watching us on YouTube. Thank you so much for joining us today. And uh, there's uh, going to be future events so make sure you subscribe to our youtube channel and uh, also uh, click on that little bell to get all the notifications about future upcoming programs that we have here on our marine mammal rescue center channel uh, also make sure to visit mmrpatients.org that's mmrpatients.org if you want to learn more about the patients that we currently care for at the rescue center if you're looking for julius's internet address uh, i've posted his website address uh, in all our chat channels so you can uh, refer to that and with that uh, we're going to say goodbye to our YouTube community. Thanks again for watching and uh, everybody have a good day. Indeed.